Welcome to the Reinvent America series. Welcome back to the, we're starting to kicking off the fall series here with a round table on how to reinvent digital education with a focus on K through 12 education. Now some of you uh, might know that actually we did all through the summer a three month project with six round tables on how to reinvent higher education essentially, reinvent the university in partnership with Georgetown University. Uh, that's all put to bed. We've got a final documentary style video. You can kind of see all we accomplished in that higher education space. But in this series, uh, which is the Reinvent America series, we're partnering with Tech for America, or that's uh, T4A.org. This is a group of entrepreneurs, technologists based in the Bay Area and, and Seattle, who are really concerned with uh, pushing or, or making sure a lot of the benefits of digital technologies, new technologies, are essentially uh, shared in the public sector and the civic sectors, and trying to figure out how to make that public sector, uh, private sector divide uh, less kind of sharp. Uh, and so we're actually this today talking about a much more fundamental infrastructure of our K through 12 education system, and which many people would argue is a more important system in terms of a thriving uh, democratic society with opportunity for all. Uh, there's three areas where there's really need for fundamental reinvention in this space. There's really what do students learn? You know, what is the curriculum now in the 21st century, particularly with our kind of highly technological kind of society that they're moving into? The other one is like, how do we learn differently from the 20th century? You know, how do we actually integrate uh, technologies in the classroom or also online, blend online and offline learning? And then the third one is really, what is the infrastructure we're going to need to actually do that right? All three areas are things we're going to discuss today uh, in this roundtable. And one of the folks, uh, the person that's going to basically lead this conversation, the anchor of our roundtable as we think of it, is Hadi Partovi, who uh, is a terrific person to do this. Uh, he is uh, the co-founder of Code.org, which is an organization that's really mission is to get uh, computer science education uh, available in every school and with at least access to every student. Uh, it's a big mission, big swing. Uh, and that's what he's behind. But he's also a serial entrepreneur. He's a highly successful. He's had two, two, at least two highly successful companies. One which was bought by Microsoft, the other by MySpace. Uh, so he's uh, he's done it that way. He's also a very highly successful angel uh, investor, and he's invested in some uh, early into some of the key companies like Facebook, Dropbox, Airbnb, and others. He gets that piece of it, and now he's applying his brain into how do we reinvent education. So he'll, we'll get to him in a second to kind of uh, kick off the conversation. But the beauty of reinventors is that it's not just about one person's ideas. Uh, it's really the, the mixture of different perspectives coming to the round table. And with that, we've got a fantastic group today. And so what we're going to do is go around the round table and just have everyone kind of really just introduce themselves, their organization, uh, or what they're doing, and how it relates to what they bring to the table. So let's go maybe first with, uh, I don't know, Jeff, do you want to go first? Oops, got to unmute there. Getting there. I think I'm unmuted. Yes, hi, I'm Jeff Ralston. I am the, uh, I, I'm a technologist. I've been a technologist for many years in, in Silicon Valley. Um, the reason I'm involved in this conversation is because I'm the founder of an educational technology accelerator named Imagine K-12, uh, which, um, which is modeled after Y Combinator, which is a very well-known tech accelerator. Imagine K-12 was was founded in late 2010 and what we do is we fund um, startups that apply to our program with $100,000 and help them with advice and connections and, 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 and a, a program focused towards helping them get uh, their first round of funding sort of to, to take flight. We're, we're really focused on, on educational technology uh, startups because we think that there's great potential to, to disrupt education in the most positive way possible to positively impact kids in the United States and around the world. Great to have you here. Thanks. Uh, and you're coming in from, where are you coming in from today? I am in Atherton, California. Oh, yeah? All right. Uh, Mandeep, do you want to introduce yourself? What do you bring to the table? Uh, sure, yeah. Mandeep Dillon, um, uh, I'm not a technologist uh, or an educator. Uh, so I bring to the table kind of a passion for how uh, things are changing. Um, I'm a children's technology advocate in that as a parent of three young children uh, who are 7, 10, and 12, I really look at how the technology that they're using has fundamentally changed uh, their, their life and, and project that forward. Um, so I'm the founder and CEO um, of a company called One Student Body, uh, and our goal really is to connect the world's students as we've transitioned from an information age where information really drove value 
Uh, I think our kids are going to be growing up in what's going to be known as the network age, where your networks grow value. Um, and I think the way we've set up our system of education, uh, while it made sense a decade, maybe two decades ago or longer, really doesn't reflect how the future is going to be. Um, children today are primarily engaged with the people around them physically in the world while they're connected to the entire world. And so we're trying to find ways to build those connections more strongly to allow them to develop interests, strengths, and weaknesses. Um, so that they can uh, become stronger and better with everything that's around them. So I'm really focused on how the presence of technology creates the potential for change, and what we can do as entrepreneurs, educators, uh, people who care about society to help drive uh, more acceleration in that space. And so we're trying that with our company, and I'm excited to just be part of this conversation today. And we're excited to have you here. Um, now, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, I'm Nell Hurley, and I'm here from Education Superhighway. We're a nonprofit, um, and our mission is to upgrade the internet access in every public school in America, um, so that all of our students can take advantage of everything we're going to talk about today. Um, and so there are, you know, lots of different um, avenues, of course, that this this conversation can and, and will take. But sort of what what I bring to the table is a focus on that sliver, but a pretty critical sliver of the conversation around internet infrastructure and getting the network that um, schools and school districts need to be able to take advantage of technology in the classroom. Awesome. Great to have you. Sherry, you want to jump in? Um, my name is Sherry Smith, and I am the managing director from uh, Richmond, which is uh, running a program called Making Waves Academy, as well as Making Waves Foundation. And we've been around for 25 years, and we are working with students who are first generation, so first to go to college in their family. And we have been, again, for 25 years, trying to create a pipeline and a pathway for students who didn't have access to a college education to actually have access. So we are now running um, a public charter school that serves grades 5 through 12. We have a middle school, 400 kids, 400 kids of a high school. And then those students are turned over to the foundation and there's a full-time staff of college coaches and financial aid advisors who work with those students through their college experience to make sure that we get as many kids um, obtaining a bachelor's degree as possible. So um, obviously we're looking at a variety of ways to make sure that our students are both current in what's going on in the world today, um, but also have access to being on the cutting edge as to, uh, again, the majority of our students are first generation, low income um, households, which mean they all um, are available to get free and reduced lunch. Great, great to have you here and kind of on the ground kind of look at this conversation for sure. Uh, Kitan, do you want to jump in? Sure. I'm Ketan Kothari, and um, I actually have now been um, a serial entrepreneur for over 20 years uh, with uh, basically training education technology, specifically for the K-12 classroom. The, um, so after Apple, the first company that I started, uh, founded, and was a CEO is uh, called AlphaSmart. We took that public in 2004, got acquired by Renaissance Learning which is another company in our space. And our most recent uh, company that I'm involved with and where I'm the, on the executive team as you know, marketing is Edmodo. And Edmodo is basically the largest learning network. Our mission is uh, to help improve learning outcomes uh, for every, learn every student. And so uh, we have a pretty tall mission to go after. And we, ha we are pretty excited about all the various activities and offerings that we already have and a bunch of stuff that's yet to come. Great to see, uh, and we'll look forward to what's coming. Um, now, we have a terrific, as great as this group is, and it's a terrific group, um, I will say nobody's as smart as everybody, as we say around here. And so folks that are watching, you can watch it, if you're watching on our site um, at reinventors.net, um, you can watch it there live, the live stream. You can actually add comments there. If you're in the Google Plus environment, uh, you can add your comments there, questions there. Uh, and also, if you're uh, on Twitter, you can Twitter with the hashtag reinventors, hashtag reinventors, ORS. Uh, we do have folks monitoring that. We will cycle in some of the best and interesting questions, if not into this actual conversation here. We certainly will as we package up our final edits and our final kind of work at the end of this whole thing. So uh, I encourage you to do so. So let's go back to Hadi. Hadi, this is a space uh, 
you've been really uh, applying yourself to. Why don't you set up the conversation a little bit uh, with some of your initial thoughts here as we and then run into the conversation. Sure. You know, my focus at Code.org has been on helping make sure every student in every school has the opportunity to learn computer science. And that's really, to some extent, tackling the question of what is it that we're teaching in our schools and how are we preparing our students for the 21st century. But a lot of what we're doing also relies on changes in how we're teaching. At. And, you know, in computer science, one of the interesting things is we're at the nexus of both changing what we teach, but also changing how we teach. Because when, when students study computer science, they, you know, built into the course is the fact that they're working with a computer as part of the course, uh, which means the school needs to provide the infrastructure for doing that. And then having the, the student and the computer together opens up the possibilities for how the learning happens as well. So I think, you know, for me, the, there's an interesting question of how does education change in the 21st century? Uh, in most schools, what we teach and how we teach it and the infrastructures you, that we use for teaching is incredibly similar to how things have been for 200 years. The courses we teach, uh, you know, the emphasis on what different courses are on the curriculum haven't changed very much. Uh, the infrastructure has changed slightly. Uh, you know, there's more smart boards around than there are uh, blackboards, or, or, there, or, you know, smart boards and whiteboards are on the increase compared to blackboards and chalk. But the other than that, uh, how we teach, what we teach, and the infrastructure is mostly the same. And I think all of those are things that we need to reimagine in the 21st century with the explosion of technology around us. Uh, it's not easy to change at an institution as large as the public education system quickly. Uh, but we see all around us everything in the world is changing because of technology. And this is also a field that is going to need to adapt in many ways. Uh, I wanted to start, start first talking about the question of how we teach and how is that already changing and what are the ways that it can change uh, thanks to the advent of uh, you know, all the new things in technology, whether it's mobile devices, touch screens, uh, broadband internet, et cetera. Uh, and maybe, Jeff, if you have some thoughts to talk about uh, that to kick it off, it would be great. So what, what are you seeing in the, in the startups you're funding at Imagine K-12? Um, sure. Hi. Thanks. I, I've been thinking a lot about about the way we teach, and um, recently, as I've been working with my son, who's a sophomore in high school, and uh, uh, this this overlaps a lot with what we teach. They're they're sort of um, you know inextricably linked. But you know, the other night we were we were um, studying the polyatomic ions, and he had to memorize. Um, you know, for you know, it, took, it seemed like it was taking hours. Thirty different ions and the, their charge, and you know, precisely what the chemical formula was, and and it just seemed so old-fashioned, like teaching cursive. Or so both the methodology of you know, why were they spending their time thinking about um, what a formula was instead of discussing in class, which is really what you want a teacher to be doing, right? And we talk about how we teach. What a teacher should be doing is maximizing the potential of each child. And doing a lecture, standing in front of, a, of every child and giving them exactly the same information in exactly the same way um, it, it, it is anachronistic. What, what, what technology can provide and what, what some companies that imagine K-12 are, are trying to do, what what, um, in a sense, Sal Khan is trying to do is allowing kids to absorb information the way that's appropriate to them. And that, in, in, in essence, and, and I, I guess this is one of the real, I think, um, the, the real powers of what, what technology can bring to the whole equ equation is that it allows teaching to be so much more individual. And I think that's, for me, the, 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 the the difference between how we taught 200 years ago and how we're going to teach in the future is that teaching will be much less like a factory and much more like an individualized, personalized experience for each child so that each child can reach the potential. Yeah, one thing, I mean, certainly in terms of the potential, you know, people now, if you use Facebook, you realize every single person's Facebook page is completely different and personalized to them. Uh, and technology can give people incredibly personalized experiences. And there's certainly the possibility for uh, technology to help personalize education, at least the part of education that, that happens on a computer. Uh, Sherry, yeah, how I, much sorry. could you relate this to sort of what you're seeing on the ground? I mean, certainly one thing we see a lot is students are learning on their own differently than before. But how is that impacting? What, what do you see in, in the schools on, on the ground? 
Well, I think the really important thing, and particularly um, what I would see, is that if you are of means, if you're middle class or upper middle class, um, both you and your child have um, experiences and exposures and access to be able to do all those different kinds of things. Um, I can tell you that in most public schools in the United States, none of this is going on in any real fashion, um, and kids certainly don't have access to it on an ongoing basis, certainly not 24-7, usually not in their homes. Their homes don't have the bandwidth. Um, their libraries are closed. Um, and so, um, you know, students are loving um, having the access and the ability to learn on their own. I mean, lots of students are using um, Khan Academy example. We're using it in our uh, school as well. We're trying to get kids to learn how to learn themselves. How do they learn? So also teaching kids a lot of Mel Levine's work in terms of all kinds of minds. How, how does a child know the best way that they intake information? But all of that is really um, at stake if you have teachers that don't know how to teach in that way. So our teaching um, schools, um, schools of education are still, as you said, teaching teachers to teach like we were all taught 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago. So we haven't even come close to putting adults in um, spaces that can help students actually learn how to use this tool to learn best. Mandeep, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, I think it's really fascinating, and not coming at it from either a technologist or as an educator, what I'm coming at as an observer, um, my last company really built, we built a social network for six to ten year olds because you began to see for the very first time with one-to-one -one computing and broadband access coming into people's homes, the usage patterns of young people connected to parents who are using technology was beginning to change. This started in 2007. But we actually noticed something in 2011 which is pretty fundamental, which is, um, you know, while college students had access to one-to-one -to -one computing since the very early days of Facebook because most colleges required students to have laptops and they had the best internet in the world, we saw a really tremendous growth happen at the 18 plus category. But high school kids never had their own computer, right? They would either share a computer at home and they would share a computer at school. And this is notwithstanding Sherry's comments on there's an entire segment of the population that doesn't even have access. But if you were to kind of go a little step up to what we would say middle class families all the way up, they had access. Well, but they never had one-to-one -one computing. At the end of 2011, we started to see that change. 30% of U.S. high school students had smartphones at the end of 2011. At the end of 2013, that number is in the high 80%, right? So again, notwithstanding Sherry's comment on um, there's a segment of the population that doesn't really have access, the vast majority of high school kids do have access with devices that are actually incredibly powerful, more powerful than most computers that people had not too long ago. And so what we have the opportunity to do, which I think requires some fundamental rethinking, is not about push learning, which is what we've done since the beginning of time, but what does pull learning look like? What does it look like when the students are the ones who are going out there and grabbing information and then driving it into their own way, this Mel Levine type work of how kind of learner are you? How do we put some of the responsibility and opportunity directly into the hands of students to drive that learning themselves? That opportunity just started now, right? Because of smartphone proliferation, because of the easy access of broadband, um, and again, notwithstanding Sherry's point, which I completely agree with too, there's a category that we're missing. Um, the vast majority of high school kids today have a tool they never had before, and there's a lot of opportunity because of that. And Katan, did you have any comments you wanted to add? No, um, uh, uh, just unmuting. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the interesting thing about also, to take on Mandeep's comment, of course, certainly the actual, as the devices and connectivity um, improves uh, in the classroom. Um, the the ability for teachers to teach uh, with various different forms, whether you talk about all the new things like Khan Academy or YouTube or any of that stuff, also improves significantly. But at the end of the day, um, you know, the, te the teacher is a pretty essential. I mean, you you do need a mentor, you do need a teacher. The job of the teacher probably was going to change, and the way they're going to be delivering the education is going to change as we have more and more devices and connectivity. And, uh, you know, Mandeep, you, when you mention 80% of the students have uh, access now to smartphones, we see that, you know, with Edmodo. I mean, you can see now that as more and more mobile devices are coming online, especially in uh, developed countries, uh, the usage of Edmodo and the way it's used even within a classroom and outside of classroom for things like homework, is changing pretty rapidly. And so you, we can see, we can observe the changes that are happening in real time as this is going on. Now the digital divide itself clearly not only is there 
market within the US, but it's even more significant globally. You know, there are certainly just vast swaths of the world where they simply do not have connectivity or devices. Um, and that's a different story. Sherry, yeah. do you have a, or sorry, go ahead now. Uh, sorry, Sherry was commenting about the lack of access to devices in the classroom. I mean, you guys at Education Superhighway, you know, that's your main job is to look at that across the whole country. How does it go? Yeah, no, I was just going to add as it relates to teaching, and we're, we're focused on the, the infrastructure element of it much more so than the devices themselves. But as it relates to teaching, I, we hear time and again, I was actually just speaking with an educator right before this conversation, um, how, um, you know, many don't, you know, have maybe one or two very frustrating experiences with technology in the classroom, um, typically related to bandwidth and not being able to accomplish what they had spent probably hours planning to accomplish um, with their students and um, therefore and not surprisingly feeling very hesitant to try that again um, it, not sure whether that technology um, or the bandwidth will be there to support what they want to do in the classroom so um, just as it relates to teaching I think just um, coming back to infrastructure being so critical to just completely removing that as a barrier to um, for teachers to feel comfortable that that's going to be reliable and fast and they can um, then not have to think about that element and, and take advantage of um, the actual tools and, and curriculum that they're trying to use. Yeah, clearly, you know, building tools that can be used in a sort of 100% online environment is a good goal, but is a goal that can't be actually realized in the actual classroom until the actual classrooms have one-to-one -one devices and the broadband internet. Uh, Sherry, in a world where s students don't have the one-to-one, -one, but they do have smartphones at home, uh, like Mandeep said, are there ways that teachers can adapt what they teach, knowing that these kids could theoretically go on Wikipedia or Google or YouTube? Uh, you know, a lot of kids, certainly in the middle class, are learning all sorts of things on the internet on their own, uh, and are teachers able to to adapt to to help use these tools? Absolutely. I mean, there's certainly ways that you can do that. But again, if I even just looked at our, you know, population of 800 students, um, I, you know, even if kids have phones, they don't certainly have the capability of having um, access to being online on their smartphones once they get home. You know, we have a complete wireless. Um, set up at our school. It's wireless everywhere. We have laptops everywhere. We have, you know, students can click on and we have smart boards and, um, you know, and our kids are really being exposed to technology though for the first time as an educational tool. So they've played with it. Um, they can do games on it, but in terms of learning how to actually get information off of using internet as a tool, using technology as a tool, that is a brand new experience for our kids coming in as, as fifth graders. And so it takes us a good three or four years to get them comfortable um, with it. And then also helping kids understand that, you know, just going to Wikipedia doesn't mean that that's where you're going to find the best answer, right? So there's a lot that you need to teach students in terms of how do you access and then how do you, you know, create analysis and synergy to figure out what really is the right answer that you're looking for. Can, can I just jump in because I know a little something about uh, your school, Sherry. Why don't you give a little context because your school is a really unusual school. I mean, you're taking the really tough, I mean, kids who have no opportunity and you also have a lot of, uh, it's not a public school, so you actually have outside investment that allows you to do things at not every school. So I would, I would just put your years in context because it's an interesting case uh, in some respects of how you're taking the tough cases but you're also well endowed to actually do a lot of things that, that, that the really hard scrabble public school wouldn't be able to do. Is that, is that the way to frame it? Well, it's, it's a little bit fair. So we are a public school and we are just a public charter school. So I don't know those of you who understand the charter movement. It wasn't something that we really um, wanted to go into as an organization but felt that we were in a situation where less than 5% of our students um, in our district, which is 110 square miles, West Contra Costa Unified School District, was um, actually preparing students to be ready for college. And so we decided in 2007 to be a community-based organization that created a public charter school um, that actually received public school dollars. But we also knew that $7,000 
was not going to be what our students needed in order to be able to be college bound. So we put in a very robust infrastructure to have 50 to 60 percent of our funding come from other donors outside of the state system. So we are public school, public charter school, but if you saw our campus, which we built from scratch, 100,000 square feet for 800 students, um, our kids often talk about, yeah, I go to a private school. Well, they don't. They go to a public charter school, which we believe every child actually in the nation should be able to have this kind of schooling. Um, but the schools they come from um, do not have the infrastructure any way, shape, or form to be able to do any of these things that you're talking about. Um, our school does. Um, we're in the process of determining whether or not we can give every single one of our students a tablet. Um, but it is, it, 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 it's, it's really about the haves and the have-nots and that has not really changed in the last decade as all these other things have happened um, and the fast pace that's gone on, it's been great and it's been wonderful and those of us who have children, I have two children myself who are college grads who, you know, it took my children, you know, hours to get on their high school page to get to their homework because my home was really, really slow. Um, and our kids don't even have that. So I just want to make sure that we're always aware that particularly as the population is changing, particularly in California, um, where we're going to be a majority, um, we're already a majority minority and we already have 80% of our public school kids are really low income, that we need to think about how we're going to get inexpensive things in their hands to do the things you guys are talking about. Amandeep, you had a point you wanted to make about Wikipedia? Well, I think, uh, so one, I, you know, I would love to, to dive onto um, what Sherry just said as well in terms of the infrastructure is ultimately an issue. And I think uh, as we start to look at our crumbling national infrastructure, we have that adds a really important question. Um, and so it's kind of two parts to my comment. So number one is that, um, you know, if you really looked at education as a matter of national security, um, national security being about global competitiveness and our ability to kind of keep up with the rest of the world as we're fully ingrained in an information society uh, and moving on from there and not having our kids with the best access to the best information uh, puts us at an international disadvantage. So number one, the infrastructure issues and the way you guys have built your school share is really compelling because it starts to give an example. But it were case a national priority decision, right, is that is it a national priority to create this, you know, movement that we're talking about? Um, and if we thought so, then internet becomes the infrastructure that's required. So the fact that kids don't have access at their homes is the type of thing that we addressed when we decided to build roads in the national highway system, right? So 50 or 60 years ago, we made an infrastructure investment that's actually fundamentally changed our economics. The internet is that same issue today. But one of the pushback points that you get from teachers and educators, at least that I've seen, is that, well, yeah, the internet is great, but it's not everything to everybody, right? And the Wikipedia example is the one that I wanted to bring up. So two parts of the comment. One is that that global importance is there, but when we get down to the details, you start to hear a lot of noise. Well, one of the interesting things to keep in mind is that, you know, look at who I am. I'm a Sikh growing up in the United States. I grew up in rural North Carolina in a really small town. And um, my public school education uh, would have led me to a more than 50% dropout rate. And quite frankly, the limited resources that I had in the small town that I was growing up in generally don't match up to anything that my kids have today. So it seems to be generally believed that the teacher that I had in this really small town was going to give me a better education than the world's resources on the Internet. And to me, that just falls flat. Right? And while we certainly have to get kids better equipped to deal with this world of information, my children are head and shoulders better off than I was growing up in rural North Carolina 40 years ago. And I think we've just got to move the conversation forward to start to say, hey, Wikipedia has its problems. Right? But at the end of the day, so does you know, the majority of teaching in this country where teachers are really not equipped to prepare our kids for their future. So we've got to really take this national priority discussion to a much higher level. Um, and I, I applaud what you guys have done, Sherry, to show an example of what to do, and I think it's awesome, and I hope people would just dive onto it much faster uh, and not kind of diminish the impact that we're seeing as we transition from a purely analog world to a much more digital one. Jeff, since you're seeing dozens of startups really inventing what they believe is the future, in, in a world where there is unlimited infrastructure, what do you think the sort of how we teach you know, the things we teach, how, how, what's the sort of most inspirational or different than the norm way you think about uh, how teaching could happen? Yeah, uh, you know, um, I, I, to that point and to the point of the conversation that's, that's been happening, what we're saying is not just a theory. It's not, it's not theoretical. Hey, one sec, hey, Andrew. 
Sorry, we have some vacuuming going on here. I <laughs> hope you can hear it. Um, uh, the the um, when I hear what Sherry has to say, I find it incredibly encouraging because a lot of the change that we're talking about and how we teach and what we teach is already happening. It's not happening everywhere. There's not a nationwide infrastructure uh, um, that that we could be really proud of today, as Mandeep says. But there, if we don't make it a national priority, if we don't um, provide every child in the country with the, the, the infrastructure necessary and the teachers necessary to have a great education, then shame on us. But there are plenty of examples of amazing schools like Sherry's. Like you look at what's being done at Summit Public Schools in the Bay Area where, where, um, where the industrialized model of education has basically been thrown out the door where teachers are having to reinvent themselves, not to, get, not to leave the classroom, but to, to participate in each child's education in a very different way. Uh, um, what some of the things that I see uh, are are um, are using technology again not to in any way replace a teacher but to help a teacher scale in a way so that that teacher can have the data and the information about each child to help that child achieve whatever they can achieve um, a lot of what that takes that it, it takes a, um, a bunch of different forms in classes, you, you often see flipped classrooms where instead of uh, a, a uniform lecture, kids, kids learn at home or in various other contexts. And then what takes place in school is, is you know, more inquiry-based learning where kids and teachers work together in groups to explore topics, to learn critical thinking, to, to dig more deeply into subjects that they wouldn't have been able to do if they were merely focused on, on rote memorization, for example. Yeah, um, I, I'd like to add a little bit here as well. Actually, first to add to Jeff's points, and Jeff, Jeff, absolutely, I totally agree. I think the way teaching is going to happen is going to change, but I don't think fundamentally we can take away the teacher. And to Mandeep's point, you know, I mean, we've always had, I mean, if you look historically, uh, specifically in the U.S., uh, we've had uh, great teachers, I mean, throughout, if, and every single uh, economy that has uh, great teachers actually as a country produces much better GDP. I mean, so some of these things are pretty much known. The real question is, what do we do about the teachers who are, you know, bad? And I think that that is much more a, bi a bigger issue here than just saying that we're going to either eliminate teachers or kind of completely fundamentally change the way the teachers are going to, uh, you know, be teaching other than once we have enough uh, devices, connectivity, infrastructure, all of that to go with uh, with it to basically make that happen. Can, can I just jump? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead now. I have something to add. Go ahead now. I don't think anyone's saying eliminating teachers. I'm not. I don't think anyone on the panel would <laughs> would support that one. So, but I think the scaling piece is an interesting one um, that Jeff mentioned. Especially we think about this with the. Infrastructure, and I know we're going to talk about that a lot more later, um, but for students in areas that, you know, don't have access to certain types of content or um, AP classes or um, things at their school, whether they're rural or for whatever reasons can't um, bring those things to them, technology can, you know, can be a huge asset, especially when their teacher recognizes those opportunities for those students and can seek those out. Um, and has the has the tools to be able to take advantage of this. Hey, hey I'm, I might add something too, just to this uh, briefly. Is uh, I, met, I alluded to it in the beginning of the conversation here, but reinventors has different series, and we did a whole series with reinventing the, the university with Georgetown uh, University. We had literally 40 plus 50 people over the course of three months working on that. Um, and I will say, what's interesting here is the parallels. I just want to kind of put this in context: is even in higher education, and even in the elite universities like Georgetown, which have had you know awesome bandwidth and every student has you know laptops for a long time they are going through huge struggles with getting the shift in the faculty to go from that traditional I'm the lecturer I'm the guy who knows everything to having to shift into mentoring uh, cognitive coaching they talk about now and, and all the different ways of shifting their kind of role there is a huge struggle particularly around tenure because you can't make a lot of tenured people do anything honestly so I'm just saying that uh, a little bit as as a way as as, as to make us feel like it's not just K through 12 and it's not uh, 
where this shift between the teacher's mentality and the, and the modeling of teachers is going through a big shift. It's happening all over and it's not easy. It's a, it's a huge structural thing and it's, uh, it's happened to the best of them even at the high end here. So uh, now that said, there's a lot of progress being made. People are coming around and I do think it's a solvable problem but I do think um, it's not, it's not um, surprising actually that you're going to find it the same at, on the ground in the, with the teachers in, uh, in the uh, public schools and, uh, and the private schools we have here in K-12. through Anyhow. I, I just want to um, add one more point on, on the whole teacher and technology thing because I think it's a fraught discussion and a lot of people want to say, oh, you know, it is a bad idea to replace teachers with technology, but I, I don't know anyone involved in educational technology that would say anything like that. In fact, I actually like to, to put the most positive spin on it I can, which is that what technology will do at its best is to actually allow teachers to focus on what's really important, not spend hours and hours doing lesson planning or even grading by hand papers, but to allow them to focus on how each child is doing and how each child is learning and how they can play a role in optimizing that for each child. And it seems to me that in the end a teacher's job gets much better and that, that we'll have better and better people um, uh, falling in love with teaching because it doesn't become this thing that is, you know, the, the same lecture I've given 4,000 times. It becomes something new and exciting every day in every class. And I just think that's a, a, an incredibly positive thing for teachers. There will be pain, I, I admit that, but in the end, I, I have great hopes for, for teachers really resonating with the, with the power this is giving to them. Yeah, the, the mention of uh, the grading is actually a perfect example of something that I don't think anybody thinks, thank God we have grading being done by humans instead of by machines, especially for things like math problems. Uh, nobody's, you know, if, if all the grading of math problems could be done automatically, I think everybody would be pretty happy and the teachers could just look and see, you know, if, if every teacher could just have an automated tool that says, here's what each student is having trouble with and what they've succeeded at, and the grading has been done for you, uh, I'm sure you'd have just more teaching capacity spent on what's important. Uh, just to give an example of how Code.org is applying the use of technology, you know, we have the luxury in teaching computer science, not that every child has a computer or every school has a computer for every child, but at least every child who wants to study computer science, having the computer is a requirement. So uh, we just assume that you have one, that it's online connected, uh, just because this isn't a field that you can go advance too far in, in a, in, without any sort of device. And once we assume that every child has a computer, there's a lot of things we do differently and we, and once, once we assume the online connectedness of that computer. Uh, and fortunately, computer science isn't a field, at least yet, that every kid gets every day. Uh, it's, you know, some kids do it. You know, it's, it's, so, so most schools, actually, that we work with have enough computers and enough broadband to adopt our programs. But in terms of how the teaching changes, you know, we, we still expect teachers to do lecturing, but we've also included really short one- or two-minute video lectures by people like Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates, you know, these like inspirational tech titans who are just known as some of the greatest, uh, best known names in technology, or even Chris Bosch, one of the basketball players from the Miami Heat, uh, who's incredibly popular with kids, and they, most kids don't realize that he also you know, was studying computer science when he's in college, and he gives this short lecture defining, you know, computer science functions. A function is when you sort of put together a bunch of commands together and give them a name and he compares that to basketball where after you learn dribbling and shooting then you can put together a pick and roll and give a name to a more complicated play and just relating that in a way that, that you know that, that short two minute video in an online format brings something to a classroom or to a student that a teacher couldn't and then a teacher can then add some information on top of it uh, but more importantly the uh, the fact that then individual puzzles and how students work, do on them and work on them uh, can be done in a way that couldn't in a classroom. You know, traditionally, computer science has been taught similar to chemistry where you know, somebody gives a lecture and then after the lecture, go to your test tubes and mix some things together and see how it went. And then the teacher will come around you know, from table to table to see whether your, the little thing you mixed worked. Uh, whereas in the computer science case, the lab is the computer and that can play a role in actually grading you. So you know, we've created these puzzles where you solve a puzzle and the computer tells you whether you got it right or wrong immediately. You don't need to wait 
for a teacher to grade you the next evening and find out the next morning, you know, you immediately get that feedback. And in fact, the computer can not only tell you that you got it wrong, but if you've gotten it wrong in one of the most common ways, it can give you really specific instruction on what you should be doing differently uh, to guide you to the next step. And, and that doesn't mean that the teacher isn't necessary. It means that the teacher can spend the time on the kids that can't make it past this automated way while a bunch of other kids just go, go on at their own speed. Um, so it, it's really been amazing to see how many teachers have adopted this. You know, we even nine months had over 40,000 teachers adopt our program, and these are obviously in schools or areas that have enough computers or bandwidth. Uh, and what's been interesting is the teachers come back to us saying that among their top complaints is this issue of, you know, you gave me all this coursework and then the students finished all of it over the weekend. Uh, what do I do next? Um, which also just notes the change of what happens when students have infrastructure, but it also is difficult if some of them have it at home and some of them don't. So, Hadi, um, can you? I, I heard you speak a long time ago on this point, but I'm just wondering, with this access question, you alluded to it on a high level earlier, what percentage of students actually do have access to computer science? Because as those of us living in Silicon Valley know, it's one of the most important kind of competitive things kids could be learning. Um, I found the numbers earlier very disturbing, so I'm wondering if you could give me some more of an update. Like, who is getting access to a real computer science education? How many kids actually have access to a daily computer science education versus what you were talking about where we're now beginning to introduce it at a very elementary level? Do you have any data that shows that distribution? So can I suggest that uh, you know, this is kind of the separate second topic switching from sort of how we teach to what we teach. Is there anybody else who wants to make comments about the how we teach uh, in, in any other fields? No, just, just a very quick comment. I totally agree with you, Harry, on, on the fact that um, at Edmodo, we have very similar examples of how physics is being taught. So, you know, you describe how computer science is being taught in very unique ways, you know, uh, not the simple boring way of like teaching structures and stuff. Um, uh, we have many, many examples of physics being taught that way on, on our, within our platform. And also in terms of grading, you know, I mean, yeah, you said that computer science and math are maybe more conducive to automatic grading. Uh, but believe it or not, um, you know there we, uh, there are lots of other uh, subjects, including ELA English, and as well as social studies and stuff. Millions and millions of quizzes being uh, being delivered and graded on a daily basis within Edmodo. So, so it's already happening. You know some of the stuff, and it's happening much more broad based um, than you would think. Yeah, one okay. thing about the pace of how it's happening: most of education traditionally has been top down, where you know, the state defines what should be taught, and the schools of education prepare the teachers, and then the pre teachers prepare the students. And most, a lot of what's happening in terms of technology is students just go on the internet and learn stuff, and then a handful of teachers adopt something, a tool like Edmodo, or a learning tool like Code.org, and they just bring it into the classroom. And in fact, in many cases, the districts or the state are actually reacting to this rather than driving it. Um, and on the one hand, that's great because why should ed education move as slow as sort of the bureaucracy? On the other hand, it's also not necessarily equal because, you know, your child may go to a school where the teacher has adopted some new technology that helps that kid, and in a different school they don't have that. Uh, you know, it it's going to take some time before this stuff evens out in terms of how we use it. Yeah. I, I, think that's, I think that's really, really true. Um, uh, I think that's uh, actually an incredibly important point that almost regardless of what the schools choose to do, the kids are going to pull them forward now and in the future. Eventually, the, the really good news is as, as there's an increasingly generational shift in schools and the kids become the teachers and they're used to this technology, they'll pull things forward as well. But you already see this in schools and you hear this where you know teachers are sort of confronted with, with children who have learned more about their subject or more newer stuff about their subject or whatever piece of the subject they were talking about and having to deal with that. And, you know, I, I've got to believe that this is an amazingly positive development. This is the, the fact that kids have access to essentially all knowledge and all information all the time has to have a pretty big effect on our educational system. And if it doesn't, it feels like we're doing something wrong. Yeah, it's amazing. It's also a little bit scary for the teachers. And I think the inequity is, at least for a period of time, actually worse because of the infrastructure access. Um, I want to switch to the topic of not how we teach, but actually what we teach. Uh, and I'll kick this off a little bit by answering Mandeep's question. You know, I got into Code.org 
uh, and doing this because you know I learned computer science and computer programming on my own, and in fact, most great computer programmers got into it on their own because the vast majority of schools just don't even teach this field. Uh, so I, like many, many others before me, I'm sure Jeff got into it this way as well. I learned, you know, when I was 10, 10 years old, my dad got me a computer and I basically had a book and I learned. At, and then by college, that, you know, there was a point where I could finally take an official computer science class. Uh, and so I started Code.org because I realized roughly 90% of schools don't teach any form of computer science. So even if you're, you're a student and wants to learn it, you don't have the option to do it at school. And yes, you could learn it on your own, some online way, the way I did, but your school won't give you credit for that. And you know, a very small minority of basically privileged kids go and spend their time learning something that their school doesn't support. The mass, vast majority of kids just don't have enough time in the day or the motivation to, to learn something that's outside of school. So. Uh, we've now moved the needle on this quite a lot. Uh, you know, when, when we started, I would say 90% of schools don't teach it. Uh, but we've now, you know, and at that point, uh, out of the 40,000 high schools, only 3,000 taught AP computer science. Uh, and the AP computer science field uh, hasn't really moved tremendously since then in terms of how many schools teach it. It's moved tremendously in how many students enroll in those in those minority of schools that teach it. So just this past year. AP Computer Science was not only the fastest growing course of the year, it's the fastest growing course of the decade in terms of enrollment, but it's still not available in a lot of schools. But our the code.org online curriculum, it's been around for nine months now, has had an amazing spread. Uh, APCS, like I mentioned, is in 3,000 schools. The code.org online course is now in over 40,000 classrooms, and that's, that's spread in just nine months. And uh, most of that is basically bottoms up teachers just bringing it to their students. Uh, and we've developed an amazing new channel of effectively reaching out to teachers directly uh, and giving them materials that they can choose to integrate into their classrooms. Uh, so the availability of computer science uh, has, I think, doubled or tripled in the last year, not only because of our work. We're not the only service providing online education in this field. Uh, and it's also increasingly grown at the younger ages, but whether it's ourselves, companies like Tinker, companies like Code HS, uh, Code Academy, or nonprofits like Khan Academy, uh, I, would, I would generally say that, that learning computer science is one of the fastest growing uh, segments of education. Um, I'll just jump in really quick, quickly uh, on, on Heidi's point. I just find this to be one of the most extraordinary egregious examples of the American education system not keeping pace with the changing world. I actually learned how to code on my own in high school, in high school, but that was 40 years ago. 40 years. And 40 years later, my child is not allowed to take advanced placement computer science until he is a junior in a really great high school in the Bay Area. It's, 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 you know, it's essential insanity, and I think what Hadi is doing is amazing and fundamental. H how can we even imagine in a world where software, as Mark Andreessen has said, is eating everything, that every child doesn't have some exposure to software? It's, it's incredible. And I think we need to think even more deeply about, like, what exactly is it important for children to understand going forward where every child is likely, or the average child is likely to change jobs five to seven times in their lifetime and have to relearn things? where the ability to think critically, to think scientifically, to think skeptically, to be able to absorb information and knowledge are the key skills going forward. And our schools have to be focused on getting our children prepared with those skills when they go into the world, whatever world they go into, which, by the way, is going to be very different than the world today. The pace of change, which has gotten us to this point, is not exactly slowing down. So. So anyway, uh, you, you need to get great kudos for what you're doing in computer science education, and I think that that, that sort of thinking is going to be critical going forward. Thank you. By the way, one thing I should clarify, because I often get asked, why does every student need to learn to code? Uh, and we've never said every student needs to learn to code, but I get that question a lot. Uh, and my view isn't that every student must learn to code as in some particular arcane language, because you know, computer languages come and go. In fact, nothing that I learned as, as a computer language, you know, when I learned it is relevant today. It was in basic and then Pascal, and nobody uses those languages again. But 
there's two things that are actually, I think, really fundamental and foundational. One is learning how technology works, just like we learn how do plants work, how does the digestive system work, how does the circulatory system work, how does gravity work, electricity. These are just things you learn about in school, not because you're going to become an electrician uh, or because you're going to become a, a biologist, but they're just part of the foundational ethos of what everybody should learn. And it's equally foundational now to teach how does the internet work? You know, what is SSL? What's, what is a microprocessor? Uh, and most kids just have no idea. If they do, it's not because school is teaching them. Um, the other type of thing is learning how algorithms work and how to sort of break down problems into their subparts and solve them in small pieces. Uh, and that's critical to how computer programming works. And it's also, frankly, the reason we teach math. Uh, you know, uh, it's not that we teach math because everybody wants to become a mathematician, but because learning math helps you learn how to think. And solving computer programming problems by devising interesting algorithms teaches the same thing, but in a way that is actually much more linked to a potential career or a potential involvement, no matter what sort of field or industry you want to go into. I, I think uh, you know what you just said, Hadi, is, is phenomenal, and it brings me to a much bigger question. I'm not an educator. Um, and so it makes me wonder, just as an observer, like when I was growing up, um, uh, a big part of my school day also include art, music, PE, and I take a look at what my kids are doing today and it doesn't include any of that. And then I remember doing less homework than my kids are doing today. So they're not doing any of these things that we would fall into the category of creative, art, music, and PE. Um, they're not doing, they're doing way more homework than doing before, but they're not actually doing things like computer science. Right? So they're, they're not, we haven't actually evolved the curriculum to include other things in a more advanced fashion that could be very valuable to them. Um, if anybody, you know, particularly those who are more involved in the day-to-day, -day, what are we teaching kids that's taking up so much time where we don't really have the opportunity to include the stuff like Javi is talking about? Um, by the way, I have a question of what else besides computer science in the 21st century, you know, should we be teaching that we aren't today? Uh, you know, I obviously have, have put, placed my bet on one field, but I, I'm not sure that's the only one, uh, if, if other people have thoughts on it. You know, we've actually, um, we, we've actually funded a couple of companies now that are focused um, not just on um, the sort of the knowledge-based curricula that you get in school, but, but um, but ideas like character development and and how kids think about the um, the way they present themselves and and and, the, and how their behavior affects how they uh, interact with other kids and with knowledge and information and adults and how they learn. So so um, companies like Class Dojo, which which actually improve educational outcomes by helping kids have a stake in their own behavior in classes and. And a company like Dean's List, which helps schools um, uh, uh, communicate with parents in, in an effective way to to um, uh, on softer skills like 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 you know um, obviously some of the more negative things like how 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 is a child behaving in class, but also in a more positive sense, what kind of leadership do they demonstrate? And and, and then you can start thinking about how you develop skills like leadership. So I think those are those are equally important and we shouldn't uh, neglect those as 21st century school uh, skills that that matter when we have especially as we have uh, societies uh, society like the United States and around the world that are that are that, that, that find ways to be increasingly divisive. Uh, Hadi to add on to the question that you asked and to what Jeff just said which I completely agree with I think there's a whole category around collaboration um, so one of the things that we find in our workers that's an incredibly important thing is that those who are the most collaborative accelerate learning among the teams in a most effective way. Um, our schools are set up as kind of winner-takes-all systems where we focus on grading and competition between children as opposed to collaboration. Uh, anything that looks like collaboration is often referred to as cheating. Um, and I think, uh, so while it's not a subject like computer sciences, which I completely agree with is there, and, and the character traits that Jeff were talking about are also really relevant, I think there's an entirely new way of thinking around collaboration that will help our kids be prepared for the workforce. Yes, yeah, certainly, especially if you think of collaboration using technology, which has changed so much in the last 10 years. Uh, you know, there's one form of collaboration of just sitting around the table and talking to each other, but doing that and then having technology to sort of put together your collective work, I think, is, is critical. By the way, yeah, given... I, I, 
I would just like to point out that, um, you, you know, if, if you take individualized learning to sort of, you know, to, to an absurd extent, it might mean a child sitting all alone by themselves with some automated teacher or online teacher learning and never interacting with another human being. Um, but, but that's not the way it really works. In fact, uh, what you see in schools that do that is, is that it's, it's, it's a much more, um, uh, it's, it's a much more open schema where, where kids are working in groups all the time and they're talking all the time and, and teachers are moving between groups and, and, and groups are forming and reforming and you know, I think this is such an important idea because you know few things, there's almost nothing you can accomplish anymore in the world uh, without collaboration. Now, there's some great examples that you know you can, you can um, hold up one of these phones and say like no one person knows how to make this. Nobody really knows how to make it. it have to, you have to build things in teams and, and, um, and I think that that sort of thinking is fundamental, that, that groups and collaboration, as Mandy pointed out, is actually fundamental, oddly, to individualized learning because when you do that and kids can come together and then come apart, they teach each other and it's a much more powerful thing. I'll just use an example. I have three 18-year-olds who work for me, one of whom is kind of permanently dropped out of high school and you're finishing him, his work individually and two that are working part-time while they're finishing up school. Um, they're all self-taught through Stack Overflow. Uh, and through other online collaborative learning resources. And I think it's amazing to me that the older people that I speak to think about that as cheating, right? Like that, that wait, Stack Overflow is a place, why would anybody ever put their code in a place where everyone else could go learn? But it actually represents that this generation, particularly the ones that are trying to achieve, have adopted collaboration in such a profound way um, that they use it outside of school, but what they try those same techniques in school is considered cheating. And it's a really interesting reflection on how we've gotten to this point of what learning really is. Um, we think learning is what teachers teach as opposed to what students learn. And it's an interesting, um, you know, opportunity for us to rethink that maybe. Yeah, it's really interesting in a world where, you know, when I went to school, the vast majority of what school was about was memorizing a whole lot of facts so you have immediate access to them. And we now live in a world where any fact you want, you have immediate access to already as long as you know how to use a basic web browser. And so all of that memorization may be much, much less relevant. Uh, you know, the learnings you get from the memorization is important. Like, not what are the historical facts or what are the morals of the story, uh, but the actual memorization is far less relevant. And tools like Stack Overflow for engineers, the equivalent of those is Wikipedia for historians or for scientists. Uh, there are different tools. Um, I also want to say on the individualized learning uh, question, the, uh, you know, at code.org, there's two things that, that, you know, I talked about how our, our curriculum is basically a personalized learning tool, but there's two things about it that make it much less individualized and much less about just like a lonely student in a basement learning by themselves. One is that when, you know, our, our curriculum is designed for in-classroom use and teachers basically sit kids together in, in front of computers. We encourage pair programming. You actually... There's studies that show students can learn better if one of them is using the, the computer and the other one is looking over the shoulder and helping. Uh, and the other is the teacher often finds that one of the students is farther ahead than he or she is, and then that student goes around and helps the other students uh, to catch up. And then lastly, just to make sure kids aren't just in front of a, the screen the whole time, our curriculum is a 50-50 blend of computer exercises versus classroom exercises that bring the class together to sort of reinforce the learning topic with a, with a sort of classroom activity. So, so I think it's quite possible to get a best of both worlds, a best of the sort of use of the computer for the personalization and the automation uh, and the use of the classroom togetherness and the teacher for collaboration and personalized sort of one-on-one -on -one time. Yeah, and I was just going to jump in. I think um, what's hard too is what asking the question, if we talk about the hard skills, the if we're adding computer science and several other the great things that we've talked about here, what are we, and this is sort of a question that I'm not sure we all have answers to, but what are we taking away? If we have limited time in the day and um, for teachers to spend with students, you know, what are we suggesting if, to answer that question, what do we teach? Like, what, what do we take away? Cursive. <laughs> I've heard That's that funny. mentioned a couple times. <laughs> Cursive is my first comment on that as well, you know. The students who are learning to write cursive in kindergarten or elementary school today, <laughs> there is no way the majority of them will need that when they get out of college, if they get out of college, or even high school. Uh, you know, anybody who's in a, who lives in a somewhat technological world is, you know, I find myself 
only using my handwriting to sign things, uh, to write checks, uh, to, to basically fill out envelopes or forms, and pretty much never, ever again. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's a glib answer to a, a fundamental and, and hard question, and, and it was meant to be glib, that <laughs> serious, but I do think they should give up cursive, but, but maybe, uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know what the answer is, but uh, I think part of the answer is, to, to Hadi's point, is we can spend less time on rote memorization and um, you know, embedding facts in kids' heads and more time on other things. And I think this has to be a, a fundamental conversation amongst educators who are, who are much smarter and um, more knowledgeable than I am about thinking about the, the world that our kids are living in and how we can best prepare them. And I think this is, you know, I know educators think about this all the time, but I, I think they, that there's the opportunity to think about going forward, what does this really mean? And, and then, um, really reinventing, uh, which I guess is appropriate given this, this, the name of this forum, reinventing how we think about education and, and what a truly educated child is. Can I, I'll just add one thing, uh, and I mentioned to you that we had this whole other series, but, and the only reason I'm doing this is I'm channeling 50 you know, experts in this field that are applying it to essentially higher education. And one of the extraordinary things of, of the Reinvent the University series was, I mean, uh, at least at the college level, they're saying, hey, we don't even know what to teach, you know, kids five years out because things are changing so fast. I mean, fields like, you know, epic biology or, you know, so many of these fields are just, you know, they're, they're moving so fast that if you spend four years, you come out and it's like, yeah, absolutely. So it was really interesting that many of the kind of the end point of what you need to teach kids uh, or young people at that stage, you know, is essentially these core skills, how to collaborate, how to think critically, how to communicate. I mean, it's, it's kind of like back to this liberal arts education, which we thought was kind of, you know, um, potentially was, was, was uh, be, we were evolving from. But in fact, in many respects, it's just these core things because jamming your head with, you know, memorizing, you know, a field or facts from an area, even at the higher education, it's just not, it's not really the, where it's at right now. So anyhow, just an interesting thought that you know maybe there is a fundamental rethink of the curriculum at the K through 12 level too to just really get back to like what do kids really need to know in terms of facts, but also what are the skills and make it all about the skills, skills, skills to learn how to learn and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'd just like to. I'd like to add. You know, while I'm not uh, really um, an education expert, uh, but you know, Hadi, to your point about cursive, it, it, you know, at, it sounds like the like the perfect thing to kind of um, remove. But at the same time, uh, I've heard that it's actually very important to um, improve fine motor skills in your brain. And you know, music has similar kind of things. So we may remove something, but we may have to add something else in its place. To make sure we don't completely lose, um, um, you know, some of the side effects, so to speak, that are being uh, being performed in the brain that we probably may or may not know about as well. So, um, yeah, actually, I have an easier thing than cursive to comment about, which is the programmable graphing calculator is something that is now required in every school in the United States. That it didn't exist when I was going to, to high school, but at this point, from eighth grade through twelfth grade. You cannot pass math unless you have one of these devices, and it's actually on you as a student to purchase one of them and to purchase its replacement. Uh, and you know, as a hundred or hundred and fifty dollar calculator, it's almost the, size, the same cost as a laptop. And yet, this is a tool where after you spend five years learning how to use it, it's the only thing in technology that hasn't become faster and cheaper and smaller. And after five years, the only job in life that you that uses this calculator is being a math teacher. Uh, so it's, it's an example of something where basically it's stuck in our education system and it's not even, this is not something that's 200 years old, it's 30 years old that it's been in our education system. But I think we, we can think about how can modern computers be used to teach the same problem solving skills. Uh, yeah, in general, I think more on that, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Especially since now smartphones can probably do a better job of whatever the scientific calculator is doing. But somebody mentioned a liberal arts education. You know, a liberal arts education has traditionally meant learning a little bit about everything, which involves memorizing a little bit about everything just to become a more well-rounded person. And I personally believe in the 21st century, the most core part of a liberal arts education is to learn 
how to access the information you need and collaborate with others to get the job done, no matter what the job is. Uh, somebody who knows how to access the information that's already out there and collaborate with, with experts and find the tools they need to, uh, which a lot of that is using the internet, uh, is so much more critical than actually memorizing the information. Uh, I think there's a really interesting transition. We've talked a little bit about it. I'll just use a, a, a clear point. I mean, since the beginning of time, information's been scarce. And you know, my parents moved here for me to get a better education. I grew up in rural North Carolina. But if my parents didn't know it, my teacher didn't know it, or it wasn't available in the public library, I wasn't going to know it. Right? There was actually no other way for me to get access to information. But my children growing up today will never not know something for the rest of their life. Right? They'll be a couple of clicks away or a few swipes away from being able to get access to any piece of information. And literally since the beginning of time, that has not been true. Uh, and it's only since the advent of the broadband, uh, broadband and more ubiquitous access through devices that that's actually been true. So we are actually seeing not just a longer term problem, but in my opinion, a really near term problem. Um, because of device proliferation and broadband, it fundamentally change, changes access and the need for memorization. So those of us who are on the cutting edge kind of look at it saying, oh my god, why are we learning all this stuff? But it actually does need, a, we do need to drive who are the people who make these decisions and how can we be, make them aware of this problem, right? This problem is a fundamental problem um, that actually just happened, right? Um, everybody has access to information now, right? Notwithstanding some of the less uh, advantaged uh, socioeconomic groups, but the vast majority of our kids growing up today have access to unlimited information. Um, and somebody has got to figure out who makes the decisions that changes the way we think about this. Uh, I don't know what that answer is. I'm just kind of curious what people think next steps might be to help drive this forward. I know, Hadi, you've been dealing with it on the CS problem in particular, but I, I don't know kind of where are the leverage points to start getting people to talk about this the right way. So I, one thing I want to talk about is to shift. You know, we've spoken about how we teach and what we teach. Uh, but I want to get back to talking about the infrastructure uh, question. And by infrastructure, I, I guess I would call it as just the capacity to teach in a new way in, in the 21st century. And that capacity could mean computational devices. Uh, it could mean internet access. It could also mean teaching capacity. Uh, uh, Sherry, do you want to go first on this topic? Yeah, I think it's important just to realize that, again, if you if students want to do it on their own, if they want to do on online, if they want to work in small groups, if they want to, you know, put things together and actually, you know, learn to learn on their own, I think that is certainly going to be the way of the future. I mean, University of Phoenix is the largest university, you know, I think not only in the country but in the world, um, and, you know, is growing faster than they know what to do with and you know um, I'd have to ask all of you would you encourage your kids to go to University of Phoenix rather than go to one of the leading universities in the United States or, or, or the US um, or, or outside of the US and so I think it's always a question is what what do middle class and upper middle class folks encourage their kids to do and how do they make that possible um, versus you know again those students who mainly now we're going to be low income and from minority groups in the public school systems in the US, if they're going to still be taught like we were taught 50, 60, 70 years ago, the huge digital divide is just going to increase. So even if we put all these things in their hands and even if we um, you know, create these wonderful opportunities, which again, I'm obviously going to support and I'm going to get our kids in the mix because I believe that is the wave of the future and it's what's going to make them successful and be able to sustain themselves and anybody else they bring into this world. Um, but we got to figure out how to how to make that happen, how to make that cleaner, how to make it more possible, and then we got to get all these different groups of kinds of people to talk to one another. So um, you know, I think it's absolutely crucial that we figure out what the infrastructure you know needs to be. Do we give every single kid that walks in a kindergarten a tablet? Um, but again, if we have teachers that don't know how to move the agenda, um, we're going to assume that five to ten year olds are going to be able to figure this out. If if you guys were all my parents, I'd be a very different person, um, and I'd have access to a lot of different things, and I would probably not do be doing what I'm doing right now. Um, I didn't have that access. I love my folks; they were absolutely wonderful. I had a great childhood experience. I'm a twin. Um, so I had a, a great experience in that regard, but I had nowhere near any of the things that you had in your childhoods. And you know, my kids had a little bit more because I had them in independent schools. I got them out of public schools, but 
you know, I, I'm always going to be mindful of those who don't have the access that even I have. Um, I'll jump in on infrastructure. Uh, we, we focus at Education Superhighway primarily on um, internet infrastructure, so I know that that's the conversation here is broader and devices and teaching capacity, and I think we could have a whole other reinventors um, session on teacher preparation and schools of education, um, et cetera. Uh, talking about the network, though, I guess um, I'll, I'll start with some facts. Uh, we're, we're data nerds here at Education Superhighway. I think Mandeep will like these. Um, uh, so one thing that's helpful to uh, to frame the conversation is today, 63% of schools don't have the internet access they need um, today to take advantage of digital learning, and that's 100 kilobits per student. Um, and then if you fast forward just a few years to 2018 or you know later this decade, um, one percent, only one percent of schools and students have what they need. So that's 40 million students um, today that don't have the internet access they need um, in their schools to take advantage of all of the great things that we've been talking about today. The organizations and companies that Jeff is funding, the work that Hattie's doing, um, you know, perhaps even difficult to get onto at Moto. So um, this is something that we care a lot about and that we're working um, a lot on. Um, the, the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, actually in July just passed um, an order uh, which we're encouraged by. And one of the things that they did in that order was to lay out um, clear targets and standards for what um, schools need. So that, I think, is huge um, just in moving the conversation forward and making sure that there's a clear kind of goal in place. So that's one megabit per student um, by 2018. Uh, that's not that far away. Uh, we know that school districts are upgrading, uh, but they're not upgrading at the pace that um, would get them there by 2018. So just a few quick uh, pieces of uh, kind of what we're focusing on. We, um, we believe what needs to happen essentially is that every school um, or close to every school needs access to fiber. Um, we, there's also a huge affordability issue. So big part of the reason that, that school districts don't have the um, access they need is they it's too expensive and they can't afford it. So there are a lot of ways that we could work on bringing down prices. And then also the focus on Wi-Fi. So we've talked a lot about devices, and we can move to that part of the infrastructure conversation too. But um, in terms of moving a lot of districts, um, trying to move towards one-to-one -to -one or have a goal in the near future to move closer to one-to-one -to -one or one device per student, um, but that requires really robust um, and ubiquitous Wi-Fi throughout the building, um, and that's a huge, um, a huge kind of barrier right now for districts as well. So, we those are the main things that we're focused on: is getting fiber, increasing affordability, and making school sure that school districts have um, the wireless um, and Wi-Fi they need um, to get there. So, I'll just put those things out there, and happy to talk more about it. One thing I'd say about this, by the way, is code.org. We've been lucky that because we're teaching computer science and not math, we haven't yet run into these issues uh, because basically, you know, the, a minority of students, you know, learn computer science, and they also, if they if they do it, they don't do it every single year. So, uh, you know, I think it's important to be investing in in infrastructure and simultaneously moving the needle of what's possible with the infrastructure we have. Um, what about teaching capacity? Sherry, uh, you know, given you hire teachers and they need to be credentialed, with all this change that's happening, are we going to be ready to handle, uh, I guess, all the possibilities that are made possible because of the educational innovations that are happening? Not even close. I mean, you know, we're going to also come up against the baby boomers getting ready to retire, even though they've held on, obviously, for a long time and not retired as early as... Uh, you know, folks that thought they were, but we're going to be down a, at least 100,000 teachers um, and certainly do not have the folks coming behind them to um, be able to uh, fill their shoes. And, you know, the other thing I was saying on the side uh, in some of the comments I was making is, you know, as I watch, you know, young people that, you know, care about, you know, this field and, you know, would love to bring more technology and would love to teach in a different way, to the field, it's really hard when, you know, if they have to intern or do a teaching credential, 
you know, they're talking twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year, depending on where they live. The Bay Area might be able to make forty-five or fifty, but even after you know ten or fifteen years, you're maxing out. I mean, you're lucky if you're making a hundred grand as a teacher if you've been teaching ten or fifteen years, and usually that's at an independent school. It's not in our public system, so we have a long way to go to put not only the infrastructure in place, but also the people in place to be able to do this work to, to continue to have our kids be awesome. But, but wouldn't you just throw it out there, given the retirement of the baby boomers, um, isn't that also a great opportunity? Because you bring in 100,000 younger teachers who are more, more kind of adjusted to a much more technological kind of age. I mean, again, you'd have to have the financial incentives and all, but it is a kind of an amazing structural opening to really reinvent you know, with that kind of infusion, you could really do a lot, don't you think? Absolutely, you can do a lot, and I think there's organizations and fellowships that are trying to do that, but I can tell you, even in those situations, I mean, we hire a couple kids from, you know, Teach for America, it's it's not something I overly support, because those kids don't stay in the educational arena, they go off to law school and med school, and go off and be engineers, you know, we don't, you know, there's fellowships in local public school systems all over the country, Cincinnati, Memphis, LA, you know, Oakland, they don't stay. And so why don't they stay? Because it's really, really, really hard to raise a family, to make a living being an educator. And um, most people can do it if their partner is, you know, bringing in a lot more dollars to help the household. But it's very, very hard to encourage somebody to go back to school and to spend forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars being educated to then go back into the classroom, no matter what classroom you're talking about, to then turn around and not be able to make more than, you know, again, I said, even our top teachers are making seventy-five to hundred thousand dollars. So uh, we need to do some great incentives. You know, let's forgive all those loans. Let's let's pay teachers a hundred thousand dollars, and I think you'll get an amazing group of young people who'd be willing to do this work and who would actually teach the way we need to teach kids today. Actually, um, it's there was. Um, a CNBC interview yesterday with Bill Clinton. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of other topics, but one of the questions that he got at the end was, "If you got um, 40 billion dollars to play with, what would you do with it?" And um, I just thought it was interesting because he first said, um, "I would, um, in America, I would provide universal access to rapid broadband, and um, that would be a you know door opener to a ton of job opportunities." Um, and then he said, I would, you know, ask someone to match it so that we increase teacher salaries and, um, you know, replicate some of the really great models that are happening around the world um, so that we can, you know, elevate the teaching profession. So I think that that was um, relevant to our infrastructure conversation in terms of, um, you know, getting, getting the capacity we need, both broadband capacity, but then also um, the, you know, teaching capacity. And, we, the, and then we just need $40 billion, so if anyone has that. <laughs> I mean, I truly think that, you know, I, I, I have so much hope and, and belief in this generation, and I think you guys are all doing amazing work, and I really, really appreciate it. I've been taking notes feverishly so I can figure out how we can uh, coordinate and get some of these things, um, you know, into our culture and get our kids familiar and comfortable with this language. But I think, um, you know, I would love to see, you know, the 25 to 35 population really take this on and really think about, you know, again, I, I truly believe computer science should be, you know, just in every classroom. It, it, it shouldn't be a subject unto itself. I mean, it's just like writing shouldn't be a subject unto itself. You know, understanding geography, I mean, you know, knowing, you know, where Syria is and where Kenya is, you know, if you ask a kid today, a map. Now they could go online and figure it out, but there's some real crucial things that I think because the world is so small, particularly to those who are 25 and under who have grown up in nothing else but this kind of a technology world and have access to the world very quickly within seconds, um, but if they don't really understand it, if they don't really have a sense of feeling like they belong, it's going to be really hard. So I, I hope we can come up with a way to get really smart people and really engaged people to do this educational work, because we do need to teach kids differently. I think uh, it's, a, it's a definitely, I think, one of the interesting challenges is as we start to think about how we teach uh, people differently is how do we agree on what people get taught and how does that work, because our structure is really focused on individual school districts making decisions and having contracts with individual teachers. I think one of the interesting challenges that we have to figure out is um, in a unionized teacher force, um, how do we really provide the right incentives for change? 
Um, how do we find ways for people to feel validated? Um, how do we find ways to make them part of the solution as opposed to really part of the problem as I'm seeing today? Um, uh, as things continue to stay the same for a very long time, there has to be an incentive-based system to make that change happen. And because we can't pay teachers differently for performance, um, that makes that problem very constrained. And so I think at a high level, people would agree that if we could find ways to create the right incentives for teachers to come into the system who could change the game, we would love to do it. But there seems to be a very big reason why that hasn't happened up until now. And, and I hope over time people will begin to address that issue as well. Yeah, I mean, separate, you, you mentioned unions and paying for performance. Uh, you know, that's a difficult topic because there's very different opinions of what performance is or how you measure it. But, you know, in general, education is, has a lot of inertia around it, whether it's with teacher unions, whether it's, you know, individual school districts or small governments that are then, you know, report to a larger state government, and governments and unions don't move fast. Uh, that said, with the work code.org is doing, we found every little part of the education system moving faster than you'd imagine to adopt something because everybody agrees on it. Some of the, some of the issues you just mentioned are controversial. Not everybody agrees on performance pay or how you measure performance. We found everybody agrees that computer science should at least be an option for students to learn and, and that, that it's unfair for a school to just not even offer it. Uh, so we found whether it's teacher unions, district bureaucracies, state level policies, all of them are moving at the speed of light compared to what they would change in other areas of education. You know, we've, we've had 14 states change graduation policies in the last 14, 15 months, uh, which is unheard of for a pace of change. Uh, these are state bureaucracies, boards of education. So I'm hopeful that, that on issues where everybody has sort of common agreement on that we can see the system change faster than it can. I'm actually, I'd like to echo that. I'm actually hopeful and, in, and encouraged. I think one thing that technology can bring to this whole equation is transparency. That technology helps you measure and helps you shine a light on what's happening in your system. Just you know, you have you can collect lots of data and and see what's happening. And there are real examples, as as we were saying earlier. You know, Sherry School is an example. There's examples of schools that are really changing the way our children are educated, and other educators see that and they see the change coming. And so we, you do see, I think, I think it's it's not an isolated case with computer science. It's a trend where educators are, are realizing that the world is changing. And admittedly, there are there's inertia, and some things are hard to change and hard to move. But um, but I think about it a little differently, which is that this change is inevitable. And what we ought to be thinking about doing is making it happen as fast as possible. Like I said before, the kids are going to drag us along whether we like it or not. And the educational system can come kicking or screaming, or it can try to lead. And Hopefully, it's going to lead, and um, and in a lot of ways, you know, I think the 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 coding example is a good one. I, I think it's coming along, and it will do so. I think this is a perfect uh, segue here because we're coming, unfortunately, up to the end of the the, the roundtable here, the session, and uh, we always like the last part of the the roundtable to actually let go around one last time to everyone on the roundtable to kind of uh, give their last thoughts on. Um, uh, the things that you, you, you've either drawn from the conversation here that you want to kind of remind folks is with some of the more interesting things, or actually a kind of a next step or something that gives you hope, for example, the way Jeff, you just talked about. So uh, I think what we'll do is um, why don't we just go around and we usually save the final comment and the final kind of wrap up to Hadi. So uh, why don't we just go around the uh, round table and just, uh, well, just sum up kind of the way you're thinking about this topic and what you think should happen next. Uh, in a broader sense, what, what do we really need to, to, to accelerate this change? Um, so, how about Nell? Do you want to start, Nell, thinking about what, where you see the the next steps, and then we'll just kind of go around everyone. Yeah, sure. Um, if anything, this conversation sort of underscored the importance of the work that we're doing and the urgency, and um, helps us maintain our focus. We we try to stay at Education Superhighway really, really focused on. Um, the network. There's certainly a lot of different avenues that we could stray um, when we think about in infrastructure, but we've uh, focused there because it's it's such an important issue. And there's um, we didn't even get to really scratch the surface of all of the opportunity that um, technology can really bring to um, the classroom. And um, so we feel urgency in our work to essentially enable 
um, all of that to happen. So this conversation and other conversations like like this one um, just give us more and more um, kind of momentum and excitement and purpose for the work that we're doing. Um, and I'm encouraged and excited that folks, uh, my our fellow panelists here, are thinking about and focusing on these on these issues because it's it's an important one. Um, so that's that's my final word. <laughs> Mandeep, how about you? What, what are you... Uh, well, I really enjoyed participating in the conversation. I think it really underscores, like you said, uh, a lot of the real value and opportunity. We live in a world of possibilities. Um, I think we didn't talk as much about where private companies can kind of come in and help drive some of that change. I know that organizations and infrastructure focus groups are really there, too. I, I definitely feel that the investments that, um, uh, that are being made by Jeff and others are, are really going to make a big deal. But I hope that um, we really get more people from outside the uh, infrastructure of education and outside the world of policy to really dive in and start to make this. Uh, if we look at it as a national security issue, which is what I do, the global long-term competitiveness of my children as they grow up in this country, um, I think we could really step up the way we think about it. Um, and uh, our company is looking at it. I hope other companies do as well. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Kitan, do you want to sum up from your point of view? Sure. So first of all, um, you know, Nell, thank you. I mean, without you pursuing more and more internet connectivity for us, Edmodo and services and tools like Edmodo wouldn't exist. So thanks a lot. And of course, Jeff, uh, for all the great ideas that you are kind of investing in, uh, continue to help improve the whole ecosystem, which we all need. Uh, and Hari, we need more programmers. We can't hire enough. So all the stuff you are doing is just wonderful. But I think the the I feel that we are at a really exciting uh, future. You know, some of the things we didn't even touch on are, for example, what's going to happen with publishers and content, and as we disaggregate from physical to digital, all the kind of exciting possibilities that lie ahead of for us, in addition to all the stuff that we talked about in terms of collaboration and, you know, all the phenomenal stuff going on with just simple uses of technology and tools in the classroom. So I feel that, uh, you know, there is so much to do and there's so much excitement and I'm uh, just looking forward to the next 10 years to see where it goes. Terrific. Sherry, do you want to give your thoughts? Oops, you're, you're muted. <clears throat> I want to say first of all thank you for uh, including me in this um, in this in in this conversation uh, not being a techie myself but really understanding uh, the importance and the value and I hope that um, all of you would be willing to come over to our campus and continue the conversation live um, let our kids see that there are real life people that are doing this for a living and that there is a way to do this and that it really involves all sorts of fields um, I hope that you all will continue to remember um, those that don't have um, as you do this work. I had the great pleasure of um, watching a, a, a nice young person be part of Code for Progress, which was brand new this year, which brought uh, low-income kids and uh, social justice-oriented folks to the world of coding. And um, it was 12 people um, from all over the world. and. I would love those of you who have access to doing that. Is is let's get that let's get that all over this country so that uh, more people can be doing what you guys are doing. You're doing great work. Thank you. And Jeff, how about you? Can I just chime in and say, really, you're doing the the greatest work. <laughs> um, so thank you and appreciate it. Definitely, uh, Jeff. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I kind of said my piece, so I'll just be brief. I'll just say one more thing, which is uh, uh, thanks to to um, to you guys, the organized reinventors uh, network, and thanks to Hadi for leading and and for all the stuff you, all all of you guys <clears throat> are doing, which is so important. I, I want to make one more point. One one group that we haven't brought in, and and that's parents. And I want to encourage all of you who are listening, who are parents. Um, to um, not be afraid, because this is happening and it's going to be scary, but parents can actually have a choice to make, which is to either help this happen or to get in the way. And I encourage all of you to do the former, not the latter. Um, we need to create a better world for our children and to better prepare them for the world. And this is, this is actually part of that, and you just got to believe. But 
um, thanks for uh, allowing me to participate. It's been fun. Well, I wanted to thank uh, everybody, not just the, the other folks on the roundtable, but everybody who's been tuning in to this or who tunes into it, you know, after the fact uh, for, for listening in on the conversation. Um, you know, and the work we do day to day at code.org every single day has been sort of an inspiring day for me because of seeing how the parents or the students or the teachers are, are adapting to something new and foreign to them. Uh, and Sherry, you were mentioning about the importance of bringing this to the underprivileged schools. We've had the good fortune of working with New York City schools, Chicago schools, uh, you know, and, you know, Broward County in Florida. These are, uh, you know, all districts where, you know, especially Chicago or New York City are all inner city schools. And the teachers that we put in place to teach computer science in these schools are reaching a very diverse group of students. So uh, I think many of the things that are happening in the world of uh, effectively reinventing education are going to happen in all of our schools. It's just a matter of time and a matter of having the optimism that whether it's changing how we teach or changing what we teach uh, or providing the infrastructure for these changes, uh, I just think of it as it's a matter of time that, that you know you can't imagine a world 50 years from now where education hasn't taken notice of technology and the internet. And so it's about having the inspiration and the, the wherewithal, the patience to get from here to there uh, over the next 50 years. So thank you all for your time as well. Uh, I guess we're, awesome. we're done. With awesome. Awesome. I just uh, I want to thank again the whole crew here. Awesome group. Thank you, Hadi, for pulling together and driving it. Uh, and for folks who are watching, uh, we're going to have an edited version of this, maybe about a ten-minute version. The highlights. We'll also have a two-minute kind of social media trailer that kind of pushes out. And of course, you can always see the entire uh, ninety-minute session anytime. Uh, and uh, spread the word. It's a huge, huge topic. It's one that's fundamental to the, the life of the country, and uh, it is going to change. I'm an optimist too. I think uh, I think the changes are. Uh, they're on us now. So anyhow, thanks all, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. All right. We're all, you can guys just hang up. That's good. And we'll follow.